Hi everyone, welcome back to Applied Immunology. This is lecture 3b, where we'll begin to build off of the last lecture on antigen processing by antigen presenting cells and start to learn more about the mechanisms of antigen presentation, which links innate and adaptive immunity. We'll begin with an overview of the genetics of the major histocompatibility complex, or MHC, and how this confers diversity of MHC molecules. We'll also touch on a concept called MHC restriction. And then we'll end this lecture by introducing the three signals required for T-cell activation, the first of which is the interaction between peptide MHC and the TCR. This last point will help prepare us to transition into next week's module, where we'll learn about T-cell signaling and activation. We've established that following infection, antigen-presenting cells process pathogen-derived protein antigens and load them onto a molecule of MHC, which allows antigen to be presented to the TCR expressed by T-cells. We've also established that antigen processing and presentation is very important, as this really is like the main critical mechanism that bridges the immediate responses of innate immunity to the highly specific and long-term memory responses of adaptive immunity. So when considering antigen presentation, we know that T-cell activation requires two main things. Number one is on the side of the antigen presenting cell, which must assemble an MHC molecule bound to a peptide derived from a pathogen. Number two is on the T-cell side, which must express a T-cell receptor that can bind to that specific peptide MHC complex. Note that the TCR cannot bind to the peptide by itself, as the TCR binds to the MHC molecule loaded with peptide. So the TCR binding specificity is really referring to the complex of peptide plus MHC. So considering that innate and adaptive immunity must work together to coordinate antigen-specific responses against a massive diversity of potential pathogens, how do these systems ensure that these receptors can bind to a wide variety of potential antigens? This diversity is accomplished on both sides involved in the antigen presentation equation, both the TCR as well as MHC. In our introductory lectures, we established that adaptive immunity is characterized by an enormous repertoire of lymphocyte antigen receptors, and these result from genetic recombination events at those genetic loci, which is a process that we will delve into next week when we talk about T-cell development. But importantly, MHC molecules also exhibit highly diverse structures, which allows them to present essentially any peptide that they might encounter following infection with any possible pathogen. In this sense, the antigen presentation machinery should hypothetically be able to load and present any possible sequence of peptide fragments, essentially allowing the innate immune system to be poised and ready to initiate adaptive immune responses against literally any species or category of pathogen. For the first part of today's lecture, we'll learn more about the ways in which diverse repertoires of MHC molecules are generated and how this ensures that we get immunological coverage of microbial antigens. One way in which peptide presentation diversity is achieved is through the fact that foreign peptides bind to MHC only at a select few residues along the length of the peptide. The diagrams here show example sequences of peptides that could be loaded onto the same molecule of MHC class 1 which again binds to peptides that are 8 to 10 amino acids long. Anchor residues are the green amino acids in this diagram and are the primary residues involved in high affinity binding of peptide to this specific MHC1 molecule. Note that in the last lecture we learned that MHC1 peptides require binding at both their amino and carboxy termini, which here are depicted by the blue box representing the amino terminus and the red box representing the carboxy terminus of the foreign peptide. The structure of a given MHC molecule obviously determines which amino acids will be defined as anchor residues, as it determines which types of protein-protein interactions will hold peptide and MHC together. The MHC1 molecule in this example must have a structure that binds to aromatic domains at the peptide's amino terminus, since the aromatic amino acid tyrosine, abbreviated by Y, is a conserved anchor residue there. It must also have a structure attracted to hydrophobic domains at the peptide's carboxy terminus, since the green anchor residues on that side, which are valine, abbreviated by V, leucine, abbreviated by L, and isoleucine, abbrevi abbreviated by I, are all large hydrophobic amino acids. As you can see with this example, for any given MHC molecule, there are only a few anchor residues that are required for peptide binding. So the remaining residues between the anchor residues, shown in the white boxes here, can really exhibit any amino acid sequence since the biochemical properties of these individual amino acids don't contribute to peptide loading onto MHC. This brings up a key point here related to peptide diversity and that a single MHC molecule can bind to many different peptide sequences as long as the anchor residues are conserved. 
It therefore makes sense that if the antigen-presenting cells in an, in an individual express many different types of MHC molecules, all of which exhibit their own requirements for anchor residues, that this functions by increasing the repertoire of peptides that can be presented to T cells. Again, this diversity in MHC is extremely important in that it ensures that peptides derived from every pathogen should be able to match up with at least one molecule of MHC that can bind to and present that antigen as a peptide MHC complex. Now, beyond this flexibility in peptide sequences binding to MHC due to anchor residues, what are some of the genetic mechanisms that actually increase the diversity of MHC molecules expressed by an individual organism? We'll learn about three of these today, polygeny and polymorphism, which are unique properties of the MHC locus, as well as codominance, which also contributes to MHC diversity. First, the genetic locus of MHC is highly polygenic, meaning that there are several distinct genes which encode a family of related proteins. These diagrams show the genetic organization of the MHC locus, both in humans in the top panel and in mice in the bottom panel. Note that in humans, MHC molecules are referred to as human leukocyte antigens, or HLAs, while in mice they are referred to simply as histocompatibility 2, or H2. Again, as the MHC genes are polygenic, both species have multiple genes encoding distinct forms of each molecule. So if we consider the MHC class 1 genes depicted by red bars, you can see that the humans and mice um, both encode three separate MHC class 1 genes. In humans, these are HLA-A, HLA-B, and HLA-C on the right, while in mice, these are H2K, H2D, and H2L. The MHC class II region of the locus encodes both alpha and beta subunits of MHC class II, denoted as A or B in either species, all shown in yellow boxes. And humans have three MHC class II genes, which are HLA-DP, HLA-DQ, and HLA-DR, while mice have two MHC class II genes, which are H2A and H2E. Also note that the MHC locus also contains genes for other important components of antigen presentation, including the TAP complex, which is responsible for transporting cytosolic peptides into the endoplasmic reticulum for loading onto MHC1, as well as the HLA-DM, which is responsible for removing CLIP from MHC class II and acidified endosomes. Note that in mice, the homologue of HLA-DM is called H2M. This is a lot of information, but please focus on the main take-home point that the MHC locus is unique from other gene clusters in that MHC is encoded by multiple distinct forms of each molecule, which we refer to, again, as being polygenic. The second mechanism through which genetic diversity is enabled for MHC is the fact that these genes are highly polymorphic, which means that there are many possible alleles for each MHC gene. Remember that the number of alleles reflects the amount of within-species variation at a gene locus. These are data taken from sequencing done by the World Health Organization, where both of these graphs plot the number of alleles for each MHC gene present in the global population of humans, looking at the individual genes for MHC class 2 on the left in yellow and MHC class 1 in blue on the right. Considering that the majority of other genes expressed by humans have a very low number of possible alleles, as in like less than five possible alleles, the MHC genes are unique in that they have a relatively huge number of possible alleles that could be expressed for each gene. And a notable exception to this is HLA-DR, which is monomorphic. Although not every genetic allele will necessarily translate to a functional protein product, this still drives home the point that the MHC locus is unique with respect to the degree of polymorphism that's displayed by each MHC gene. If it helps you conceptualize this a little bit better, we can also think of the number of alleles along the y-axis in these figures as representing the polymorphism of MHC genes, while the high number of individual MHC genes along the x-axis represents the polygenic nature of MHC. In addition to the high polymorphism of MHC, also consider the fact that most humans express two different alleles at every MHC gene, meaning that they are heterozygous for each MHC gene. Also, just as a little piece of immunology vocab, the cluster of MHC alleles that are located close together on one chromosome and therefore tend to be inherited together are often referred to as the haplotype of an individual. The last genetic property of MHC genes that enables diversity of these molecules is the fact that all of these genes are expressed codominantly, meaning that the gene products from each of two chromosomes are expressed equally. So MHC genes do not exhibit dominant recessive phenotypes that you may be most familiar with from previous genetics courses. Note that while MHC genes are unique in the human genome with respect to being highly polygenic and highly polymorphic, 
Codominance is not a genetic phenomenon that's specific to MHC. Now, if each individual is heterozygous at each MHC locus and MHC expression is codominant, this means that sexual reproduction between two individuals results in progeny that are highly diverse with respect to the MHC molecules and the combinations that they can express. In fact, direct siblings only have a 1 in 4 chance, or a 25% chance, of expressing the same exact MHC alleles, and this is again only considering one single MHC gene, so remember again that there are multiple MHC genes. This degree of MHC mismatch between genetically related individuals will be important when we get into future lectures where we discuss immune-mediated rejection of organ or tissue transplants, and explains why it's so difficult to find a compatible organ donor based on the degree of MHC matching between organ donor and recipient. To summarize the first part of this lecture, we just learned about several mechanisms which confer high amounts of genetic diversity specifically for MHC genes. The first is polymorphism, meaning that there are huge amounts of possible alleles that could be expressed for each gene. Combine this with the fact that most humans are heterozygous at each MHC gene, and the fact that MHC expression is codominant, and this means that polymorphism contributes two possible alleles expressed at the same time for each gene. The second mechanism is polygeny, meaning that each individual cell has several genes that encode a family of related proteins that could be used interchangeably. Again, in humans, we have three MHC class 1 genes and three MHC class 2 genes, and this contributes three possible targets that could be expressed at the same time. The overall diversity of MHC genes is generated through the combination of these factors. So for MHC class 1 in humans, the expression of three possible genes, each with two alleles that are expressed codominantly in heterozygous individuals, means that there are six possible combinations of MHC class 1, as depicted by this cell on the far right. This diversity is even higher for MHC class 2, which is compounded by the fact that you can pair different alpha and beta subunits from different chromosomes, and this yields a total of 12 possible combinations of MHC class 2 per individual. Again, this diversity is extremely important in that it ensures that peptides derived from every pathogen should be able to match up with at least one molecule of MHC, which can bind to and present that antigen as a peptide MHC complex to T cells. Next, let's quickly cover the topic of MHC restriction. As we've stated a few times by now, the T-cell receptor binds to the complex of both foreign peptide and MHC. For reasons related to T-cell development that we'll cover next week, the TCR can only bind to self-MHC molecules, meaning that they are the same exact MHC alleles that were used to educate that T-cell during its development and selection. In other words, the TCR and MHC must be matched from the same individual, or at least from individuals with the same MHC haplotype that express the same set of MHC alleles. The case of successful TCR binding to peptide MHC is shown here on the left, where the T-cell binds to a peptide presented by yellow MHC molecule that's encoded by a MHCA allele. Now, in the case where MHC alleles are not matched, the TCR cannot recognize peptide MHC, even if the peptide is the same. Here, this is shown by the red peptide X that has been loaded onto the peptide binding group. In this case on the right, the antigen-presenting cell expresses a green MHC molecule encoded by a different allele of MHC, MHCB, which has different binding residues that fail to interact with the TCR, even though they still bind to the same uh, red peptide X. In this case, T cells from one individual will not bind to any peptide MHC complexes presented by a genetically distinct individual, even if the peptides are the same. And we refer to this as MHC restriction because the particular MHC molecule in yellow on the left restricts the ability of a T cell to recognize foreign antigens. MHC restriction is an essential feature of antigen recognition and really demonstrates the fact that the TCR must bind to foreign peptides in the context of MHC rather than foreign antigen alone. The last thing that we'll cover today are the three signals required for the induction of optimal T-cell responses. Now the first signal is the one that we've been talking about in the last two lectures, which is the interaction between the T-cell receptor, or TCR, which recognizes the peptide MHC complex that we've really focused on. The successful presentation of antigen by APCs leads to the activation of a signal transduction program in the responding T-cell. However, antigen presentation on MHC is only one part of the equation, as TCR signaling by itself is insufficient for the activation of a naive T-cell, and naive just means that the T-cell hasn't encountered cognate antigen before. Full T-cell activation requires a concurrent receptor ligand interaction called co-stimulation. Now, co-stimulation consists of a co-receptor expressed by T-cells, um, this is often a molecule called CD28, 
which binds to one of two activation markers expressed by professional APCs, which are CD80 or CD86. These ligands are upregulated by APCs um, upon stimulation with things like PAMPs or cytokines, and allows APCs to not only present antigen, but also provide this key co-stimulatory signal. CD28 activation on T cells leads to intracellular signaling that supports full TCR signaling and subsequent T cell activation, which includes T cell proliferation programs, as well as the acquisition of effector functions. As a quick side note on immunology vocab, this area where the T cell and APC surfaces are in contact with each other during antigen presentation is something that we uh, typically refer to as the immunological synapse. Lastly, although this is not absolutely required for T cell activation, we also often consider cytokines to be signal number three of T cell activation. APCs and other cell types in the tissue environment can produce a variety of inflammatory cytokines that are then detected by cytokine receptors expressed on the T cell. When these cytokines are detected at the same time as TCR and CD28 signaling, they can improve T cell survival, optimize effector functions, and increase memory T cell formation. Major signal three cytokines involved in the optimization of cytotoxic CD8 positive T cell uh, differentiation are things like IL-12, this is an interleukin that we haven't heard much about yet, as well as the type one interferons, interferon alpha and interferon beta. So I know that we've spent a lot of time discussing antigen presentation and the specifics of MHC expression in the past two lectures, but keep in mind that antigen presentation is not the only signal produced by APCs that can influence the development of successful T cell responses. And this will be helpful to keep in mind when we get into our discussion of T cell signaling and effector functions next week. In lecture today, we've established some key points related to antigen presentation by APCs to T cells, which is an essential process linking innate immunity to adaptive immunity. The first is that productive antigen presentation requires interactions between the peptide MHC complex with a T cell receptor that is specific for this cognate antigen. The second is that there are several mechanisms by which we can generate a large diversity of MHC molecules in an individual, and that this is very important and that it helps to ensure broad coverage of potential pathogens which the adaptive immune system can successfully respond to. We've learned that the diversity of peptides that can be presented by a single MHC molecule is increased by variability in the peptide sequences between anchor residues, which are the key residues actually involved in interactions between these two molecules. We've also learned about genetic mechanisms that increase MHC diversity, which include the polygenic uh, MHC locus and the polymorphism of these individual genes, which express many different alleles. We've also established that diversity is further increased by heterozygous MHC genes in most individuals, which are expressed codominantly. Second, we've covered the concept of MHC restriction, which is the observation that T cells cannot recognize peptide presented on non-self MHC molecules, and is an important demonstration of the fact that the TCR truly binds to the peptide MHC complex as a whole. Lastly, we touched on the three signals of T cell activation and discussed how peptide MHC binding to the TCR is a critical first step in T cell activation. However, both co-stimulation and cytokine detection are also important players in T cell activation, which we'll get into more during week four. That's it for today, but please remember to watch the remaining lecture for week three, in which we'll discuss lymphoid cells with innate immune functions.